Come on, somebody ought to say amen. 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 That ought to be enough for you right there, just hearing the name, the name, the name. Jesus, it ought not take more than that. Uh, if you love him, if you believe in him, if you trust him, if he's guided your life, if he saved your soul, if he made you whole, it ought not take more than that just to hear the name Jesus. Oh, my. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. That ought to be all you need is mm. Jesus. 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 Thank you, Lord. Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you're able, I'm going to ask that you would stand with me in reverence to the reading of God's holy word. If you are able, if you are able, I ask that you would stand in reverence to the reading of God's holy word, which can be found in the book of Acts, the book of Acts chapter 1, the book of Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 14 in the New Living Translation. Say, in my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and to teach. Until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and to restore our, ki our kingdom? He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. They str as they strained to see him rising to heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, a distance of half a mile. When they arrived, they went to the upstairs room of the house where they were staying. Here are the names of those who were present, Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. They all met together and were constantly united in prayer, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. You may be seated in God's house, the word of God for the people of God. As we continue our sermonic series entitled, Are You Crazy? This is the third entry in that sermonic series. I'd like to tag this particular text and message for these brief moments of sharing we have together with the title, Hurry Up and Wait. Hurry Up and Wait. Th this brother, this brother, this preaching brother went to a shoe repair shop to get his favorite pair of preaching shoes fixed. The heels were worn down on both sides. The shoe shop repaired the heels and shined the shoes well. When he picked his shoes up, they looked good. They looked like they were brand new. The next day, he put them on, but he went out into a drenching downpour storm. It was just raining torrentially. After a while, he noticed that his feet kept getting soggy. Well, eventually, he took the shoes off, and he looked at the soles of the shoes. There was a hole in the sole of both shoes. They looked good, some work had been done on them, but the most important thing, the soul had a hole in it. And, 
And because the sole had a hole in it, it rendered the shoes useless in a storm. When, when your soles have a hole, then when the storms come, your shoes have no use. And, and often our decisions are difficult. Our commitment is inconsistent. Our faith is shaky because we have holes in our souls. Our, our souls must make their boast in the Lord. Our souls must connect to Jesus. Our souls must find joy in his presence. If we want to be steady in the storm, and if we want to make Christ-centered decisions, if we want to be as great as God made us, we got to start patching up the holes in our souls. Uh, in a real sense, there, there is this tension be between being sold out for Jesus and being conforming. It takes place in the spiritual realm because sometimes we want to walk by faith, but we're scared we have some fear. We, we want to trust God and not doubt, but then tragedy strikes our family. You want to be an overcomer, but you find yourself overwhelmed with life. You want to do right, but wrong is just so easy for us to get done. You want to break that habit, but it keeps calling your name and keeps reeling you back in. But when you're crazy, you tell God, God, I know I'm undone. I know I don't have it all together. I know I got some holes in my soul, but I yield and I make myself available to you. I'm available to change, to be changed, available to be used to witness. I'm available to be molded, to be shaped, to be blessed by you, God. I'm available. So while you don't know if you're asking for too much from God or too little, you don't know if you're stretching yourself too thin or if you're not doing enough, what you do know is you must be available to God. The only way to find balance and joy in your life is to get crazy for Jesus Christ. Christ. Uh, see, crazy folks don't worry about whether they're doing too much or too little. They just do what needs to be done. I, I will focus on what I can do and where I can be of some assistance in the kingdom of God. See, many folks get caught up and stuck in the I might not, but you're growing when you face your I might not with some I can. I, I might not know how to recite poetry, but I can help you change your oil, so use me, Lord. I, I might not know how to patch your tire, but I can teach you how to save your money. Use me, Lord. I, I might not know how to sing, but, but I can lay down carpet for you. Use me, Lord. I might not have a lot of money to give, but I can landscape with the best of them. Use me, Lord. If you're crazy enough to be available, then God is crazy enough to use you. But you gotta, you gotta say, I'm I'm available to you, God, to be used. See, when you're crazy for God, when you're really crazy, you defy history. You break patterns. You push through and you learn how to press on. You understand there are no odds too great, no hurdle too high, no trial too long, no struggle too strong because I'm just that crazy. I, I'm just that crazy to believe that if God said anything, he means anything. If he says I can do all things, through Christ who strengthens me, guess what that means? All things through Christ who strengthens me. It doesn't mean some. He said all things. I don't know how many of us really believe that if God says a duck can pull a truck, if God said a duck can pull a truck, how many of us would really hook the duck up to the truck? And watch the duck pull the truck. If God said, I'm, I'm just crazy enough to believe that if God said it, then, then that's it. He said all things work out for good. Then I'm crazy enough to believe that that means all things. Foreclosure, good, bad credit is going to work good. Tragedy, good. Temptation, good. Sickness, good. Poverty, good. It doesn't feel good to me. It doesn't look good to me, but it will work out for my good if I'm crazy enough to love God and be called according to his purpose. I'm going somewhere. Crazy folks. I've told you this before. Crazy folks because I grew up with crazy grandparents and crazy parents. See, crazy folks turn trash into treasure. They make meals out of mess. They turn hog guts into chitlins. That's what crazy folks do. They, they take dry grapes and make raisins. They take struggles and succeed. They take violence and make value. They turn their pressure into praise to for God. Crazy folks go the extra mile. So the question is, are you crazy? See, we're trying here at Antioch, for those of you who may be visiting for the first time, we're trying to build a crazy team of kingdom citizens who know it's all right to be crazy for God. People might not understand you're crazy, but if somebody says you too crazy, you just Tell them if you knew where God has brought me from, if you knew how good God has been to me, then you would be just as crazy as I am right now. Help me. 
help me, Jesus. Just, just, just if you would, for a moment, travel with me through the majestic meadows of God's word. And, and won't you meet me for a while at Upper Room Baptist Church in the book of Acts. This is Luke's account of the early church in Acts. Acts, Acts is where we first meet old crazy Paul, whose name was Saul, breathing out murderous threats against the children of God. And the divine paradox is present even in the naming of this book because Luke calls it the Acts of the Apostles because in it the apostles, the paradox is the apostles in this book really do nothing but Jesus himself and the Holy Ghost do it all. All of the church's progress and extension from Antioch to Ephesus, from Corinth to Philippi is attributed to Jesus Christ. And guess what? I knocked on the text door and they opened the door for me and I found a few people gathered and huddled at the newly formed Upper Room Baptist Church. These folks were not spiritually sane folks. They were not docile and demure about their faith, but they were crazy enough to believe that if Jesus got out, out of the grave, that they better listen to what that brother had to say. They were united by the fact that Christ's love, his directive, was what brought them together. They were tied together singularly by the love of Jesus Christ. So when they were with one accord, their one accord, their all things in common was that they all had a passion for following Jesus the Christ. And guess what? Over in Corinthians, this was what Paul was trying to recapture in the Corinthian church. They didn't have manufactured fellowship or unity in Upper Room Baptist Church, but they had it naturally because they had a common purpose in why they showed up that day. They all showed up, all that we would see Jesus. They were crazy enough to let Jesus' love be the glue that bound their lives together. Guess what at Upper Room Church? They didn't get caught up in superficial stuff like who got the most money or who has the best job or who lives on the best street, who rode in on the best donkey or the best chariot. They were not concerned about each other's history. They were connected to what their new destiny was going to be in Jesus. It, it, it wasn't about who loved Jesus the most or who loved him first or who showed up at the grave first or who had no on Jesus the longest, but the thing that made them with one accord was their love for Jesus the Christ. Jesus had told them to assemble themselves together, and then he tells them to wait. He essentially was telling them to hurry up, show up, and wait. Uh, I want to park there, and I, I had to ask the text a question. I had to ask it, how, how do I know Jesus if I'm keeping my crazy commitment while I'm waiting on you? How do I know if I'm crazy while I'm waiting? There are three answers, and we'll give and go to the Lord's table. First, first, you know you're keeping your crazy while you wait when your problem doesn't match your prayer life. Your problem doesn't match your prayer life. Your problems don't match your prayer life. Jesus tells them, you shall receive power, not you already have power, not not the power has arrived. Not you got your own power, but you shall receive power. See, sometimes we resign prayer to a corporate gathering where we got to use flowery words and long phrases to express our care and concerns to God. But prayer uh, are the intimate moments you have when maybe all you can say to God is, Lord, have mercy. Uh, maybe all you can get out is, God, I need you right now. Maybe, maybe all you can say is, cover me, Lord. Uh, when you commune with God, however, and your problems seem to keep piling up, it might be because you're just crazy for God. They, the folks in the upper room were instructed by Jesus to wait in Jerusalem until they were released from their waiting. They wanted to know, I know in the upper room, I know people, they wanted to know, when are we going to be freed? Uh, when are our prayers going to be answered? When is our nation going to be restored? But Jesus says, you got to wait. Uh, they wanted their conquering king, the one who just got up from the dead, to come through and vindicate them, to show everybody who didn't believe like they believed and sacrifice like they sacrificed how wrong they were about Jesus and about them but Jesus says you gotta wait they had prayed for a savior who would set them free from the oppressive rule of the Roman Empire but Jesus says you gotta wait he rose and they were ready to run and tell somebody but Jesus says you gotta wait and maybe they were comforted in the upper room by Isaiah's old prophecy that told them that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength uh, maybe David's song came into their memory wait on the Lord and be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart. I don't know how they were comforted but Jesus told them they got to wait. The problem, the problem with them is that they had waited for thousands of years for the Messiah to come and now Jesus tells them they got to wait again. We've been praying for times like these but Jesus you're telling us to wait. These folks no doubt had to deal with each other's bad habits. They had to deal with each other's quirky behavior. They, had to, they could not actively pursue what they thought they should be doing. The problem was that they 
had to hurry up and show up and still wait. Uh, wait without moving and stay with one accord. Wait with patience and perseverance. The problem was these were, these were active folks who were tired of waiting, but they were crazy enough to know that the problem of waiting was a time for them to strengthen their relationship with God. That's all that's all that preparation time was. Uh, that God showed it to me like this. All of us, all of us are required to do jury duty if we're called upon. All of us who's a registered voter, we're called if we're called upon to do jury duty, we got to do it. Most of us, most employees, most employees really don't like jury duty if it's required for a long time. But, but people, just, they go, we go. And if a person is chosen, however, you may be sequestered for a trial. When a person is sequestered, she's he or she is completely isolated from the outside world, from families, friends, co-workers, etc. The benefit of being sequestered is that the jury is not influenced in any way by anyone or anything outside of the room. Although sequestering is dreaded, it is necessary to keep those who have been chosen to keep them focused. If you've been chosen, you got to stay focused. And guess what God will do every now and then? God will sequester you so he can have your undivided attention. And God is trying to get our undivided, united attention. Let his love control your heart, your thoughts. Let it control your life. And sometimes God will allow the brooks and the rivers that flow into your life to dry up. Because if they always flowed, if you didn't have to wait sometimes, if you never had a moment, moment of frustration, then you might forget that your God is still in control of the water. Huh? No need to look for another job. No need to search for a new lifestyle because the problem will follow you. So you might as well wait on God and be grateful. Huh? The hell you run from on one side will show up at the house you run to. So you might as well do what Jesus said and wait on the Lord. Huh? So whatever your problem is, you ought to look up to glory and tell God thank you. Whatever you're waiting for, tell God thank you and don't let it affect your prayer life. For you brought nothing into this world uh, and it's certain you can carry nothing out. Uh, the Lord gives uh, and the Lord takes away but blessed is the name of the Lord. Uh, you're crazy when your problem does not match your prayer life. I got problems even though I've been praying. I, I'm praying, but the problems keep coming. But 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 the text, the text gotta have, gotta help me. You gotta help me. Jesus, that don't sound too helpful. Problem ain't gonna match my prayer life. But secondly, I'm headed to crazy town for Jesus Christ when your prayer life is not affected by your placement. Even though, even though your problems keep piling up, you keep praying no matter where you've been placed. You keep, you keep praying no matter where you've been placed. The folks assembled together in the upper room of a house, guess what they started doing? They started praying, praying, praying. They were placed strategically in Jerusalem, the center of religious belief and tradition to prepare for a new united movement led by the Holy Spirit. Remember that to be Christian is to be united in relationship with other followers of Christ. So this was a ministry movement that was changing the whole religious landscape. He's, Jesus was saying no more disjointed, disconnected faith, but we, what I want is intimacy with God that alters your outlook, your behavior, and your attitudes. No more surface level salvation that knows the rituals but does not have a relationship. But this is a deeply rooted religion that pushes its way into every area of your life. Uh, this is a shift from what they were accustomed to, so they needed to pray. Uh, there were those in Jerusalem who still didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. There were those that didn't believe that the Messiah had come yet, but it was there that Jesus tells them to go and wait for him. They were placed in an uncomfortable spot, but didn't allow it to impact their prayer life. And the truth is that you've gone crazy when your environment does not dictate how long or how strong your relationship with God is. When I'm placed in a tight spot, I still trust God. When I'm next to a crazy co-worker, I bless God. When they tell me I can't pray, guess what? I send one up anyway. When I'm sent somewhere I don't want to be. I bless the name of the Lord. My placement doesn't affect my prayer. My prayer is dictated by my relationship with God Almighty. Let me put it like this. If you're married, you don't stop being married just because one of you goes out of town or because one of you goes on a business trip because one of you goes to a class reunion. It doesn't stop you from being married, does it? No, it does not. Your relationship with God doesn't stop because you're hanging out with your friends. It doesn't stop because your family is crazy. It doesn't stop because your neighbors ain't saved. It doesn't stop because you're placed in a tight spot. You're crazy when it doesn't matter where you are. People will still know who your God is. I don't care where I am. You ought to know that God is with me. 
Y'all ain't feeling that yet. Well, a soldier, a soldier was brought before, before Colonel Tolles, his commanding officer, and accused of communicating with the enemy. Colonel Tolles had accused him of communicating with the enemy. He had been seen emerging from an area where their troops uh, were known to patrol. So, so the poor soldier summed up his defense in a few words, uh, stating that he had slipped away to spend an hour by himself in prayer to God. Uh, oh, oh, Colonel Tolles demanded, demanded, said, have you been in the habit of spending an hour in private prayer? The, the, the little, little soldier said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Nervously. Then, then Colonel Toll said, never in your life have you been in more need of prayer than right now. Son, I want you to kneel down and I want you to pray as loud as you can pray so everybody can hear you. Expecting, expecting that Colonel Tolls was going to do something to him while he closed his eyes, the soldier dropped to his knees and poured out his heart to God. His prayer immediately revealed the intimacy that he had with Jesus Christ. His flu his humble appeal for divine intervention and his trust in God who was strong to deliver told unmistakably that he came regularly to the throne of grace that he was always praying so when he finished praying in Jesus name uh, Colonel Tolles looked at him and said son you can get up and go huh? there's nobody who could have prayed like that that ain't spent some time with the master huh? and God just wanted to tell somebody that if you regularly go to the throne of grace if you're in constant contact with God if you talk with him and walk with him if Christ's love controls you then guess what it'll be written all over your face you don't have to say a word no matter where you're placed his presence will be all over your face folks will know by the smile on your face they'll know by the words that you speak they know by the life that you lead they know by the joy that you have they know that you don't break easily you can bend me but my hope is in God you can try me but my hope is in God you can try to give me a rough assignment but my trust is in God God. Your problems don't affect your prayer life. Your prayer life is not predicated on where you've been placed. But third and finally, and I'm done, the third sign of your craziness based on the text is when you know that where you're placed is where you get your power. Where you've been placed is where you get your power. You get power to deal with that place so the place does not deal with you. I mean, the text had, had these folks not waited in a tight spot, if they had not waited in Jerusalem, if they had not waited and kept praying in spite of their placement, they would not have received their power to transform Jerusalem for Jesus. Jerusalem was not a friendly place for this group of folks considered crazy followers of this radical man claiming to be the son of God. Some of them had been deserted by family and friends because they believed that Jesus was a blasphemer against God. Some had been kicked to the curb by people they thought they loved them. This Jerusalem was hostile territory, but I'm so glad that my God can turn your hostile territory into his hidden sanctuary. Huh? In Jesus' view, there was nowhere better than Jerusalem for the disbelieving audience to bear witness to unity and the power of God's love. Huh? And guess what, Antioch? Huh? There's no better place than here. Huh? There's no better place than Cleveland, the city of hope. No better place than right here, right now for the disbelieving and the dejected to witness God's unity and his power in action and operation. Or maybe, maybe they were comforted by reciting the 23rd Psalm that they had learned in their youth. Thou prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Oh, how they long to return to a quiet life on the banks of the Galilee River. But, but their placement was necessary for their power to show up. And the real talk is that God doesn't have to change your location to change and to upgrade your situation. Uh, he can upgrade your life and your witness right where you are. Uh, see, you thought it was about changing your place, uh, changing your job, uh, changing your house, your hairstyle, your wardrobe, but God can take the place you are and make it an oasis of his anointing. Uh, your place is where you get your power. Uh, it's where you place that God sends your power. So stop fussing about where you are and just ask God to send his power. Uh, stop complaining about your problems and ask for his power and I'm crazy enough to believe that the same power that the Holy Ghost gave to them in that upper room the same power that had them speaking in other languages the same power that saved thousands of folks every day the same power that kept them baptizing in the streets the same power that knocked Saul off of his horse the same power that broke Paul and Silas out of jail the same power that God gave to them he gives to each one of us if you'll just stay in the 
place that God put you. And if you stay there just a little while, don't leave until you get your power. Don't go until you get your power. Because when you get your power, trouble folks start asking for help. When your power comes, the unsaved get saved. When power comes, you can give your testimony. When your power comes, no problem is too big for you. You get confident. Your soul is lifted. And it changes your attitude. But you got to wait for your power. An evangelist, an evangelist conducted, conducted a revival in a church in a, in a small rural town after he had preached the powerful message. He called for those who wanted prayer to come forward, to come forward. Several people came. They received prayer, and they shared their testimonies openly, publicly before the congregation. One man, one young man. He came forward, and before the evangelist, evangelist, he was speechless. He couldn't say anything. The evangelist asked the young man, young man, are you ready to give your testimony about God's power in your life? The young man didn't respond to him, just kept looking at him. The evangelist says, son, son, can you hear me? The young man said nothing, but he took a match he had in his pocket, huh? and, and he struck that match, and, and he put the match close to his chest. He put the match close to his chest. Then, just then the deacon whispered to the evangelist in his ear, huh? He said, Rev, this man can't hear you, huh? and he can't speak to you. But he's trying to tell you with the match huh, that his heart is set on fire for God. Huh? And I wanted to know in here, huh, is there anybody in here today huh, whose heart is on fire for God? Huh? Do I have any friends in here huh, who know that your heart ought to be on fire for God? Huh? I'm crazy enough to believe huh, that you can have the same power, huh, but it comes where God puts you. Huh? It doesn't matter where God placed you. Huh? You ought to have power. Huh? You will have power. Huh? to stop people from calling our sisters and our mamas uh, outside of their names. Uh, we got the power uh, to keep our sons and our daughters out of jail. Uh, we got the power to stomp out poverty. Uh, we got the power to have speak folks and to love folks to life. Uh, we got the power to take care of our widows and orphans. Uh, we got the power to love our neighbors as ourselves. Uh, power to stop people uh, from silencing us uh, by dangling a few dollars in our face. Uh, we got power and that's called Holy Ghost power. Uh, power to challenge the status quo, uh, power to do what God called us to do, because uh, Antioch has been placed here uh, for 123 years. Uh, we waited patiently on the Lord, uh, and God promised uh, that we shall receive power. Uh, you got power in your life. Uh, you got Holy Ghost power, power to unite at the foot of the cross. Uh, you've got power, but it comes where you've been placed. I'm almost done. Yeah, yeah let, let, let me part. Let me stop there for the day because power comes at unity and unity at the cross. We're down, down in the Florida Everglades. If you go down in the Florida Everglades and you want to go on a tour of, of the natural habitat in the swamp, you might run across a tour guide named Joe down in the Florida Everglades. During each tour, Joe tells the tourists to stay a few feet behind him because the swamp is filled with dangerous poisonous snakes and other hazards in the swamp. Well, one particular group followed Joe down a narrow trail and guess what? A rattle snake jumped out on the trail and it bit Joe in the leg. It latched on to Joe's right leg. Well, you know, rattlesnakes are among the most poisonous snakes in the United States. Well, Joe quickly grabbed the snake by the head. He wrung his neck and continued the tour. The tourists were amazed that their tour guide had showed no signs of illness and he showed no signs of weakness. At the end of the tour, one of the tourists confronted Joe and said, Joe, man, are you okay? We saw that rattlesnake bite you, but you acted as if nothing had happened happened to you. Huh? And Joe then rolled up his pants leg uh, and showed how many snake bites he had up his leg. Uh, he then said, I've been bitten so many times uh, by so many snakes uh, that I got built-in immunity uh, to poisonous snake bites. Uh, and guess what? The reason that you got power, huh? the reason that you can be crazy huh? is because Jesus, uh, our tour guide through life, uh, has been bitten by every sin uh, and is immune to sin uh, and can take care of anything uh, that may bite your life. Uh, he who knew no sin became sin for us. He took your sin and took my sin. And with our sin covering his life, he died. He died and snuck his way into hell with sin covering him up. And he set the captives free. And when he showed up in hell, he showed hell and the grave that he has the power. He has the power to reconnect us with the Father. He's got the power to alter our course. He's got the power to do what we could not do. Somebody said there's power there's wonder working power in the precious blood of the lamb there's power
power in his name. There's power in his life. Is there anybody here that's glad that Jesus has all power? There's power in his resurrection. Because somebody told me that early on Sunday morning that he died on Friday. But early on Sunday morning, he got up. And when he got up, he got up with all power. Power. And if you trust him, he gives you power. Power over your habits. Power over rejection. Power over low self-esteem. The Bible says he has power. Yes, he'll give you power. But you got to trust him. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. Run, not be weary. Walk and not faint. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage. Don't wait dejected and dehumanized. Don't wait sad and downtrodden. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Your problems you're crazy when they don't affect your prayer life. Your prayer life is not impacted. You're crazy when it's not impacted by where you've been placed. And understand that where God has put you right now is where he's going to send your power. And isn't it good to know that there is power in the precious blood of the Lamb. There is power. Wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. Thank God for power. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me, shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. It says start at home in Jerusalem, go to the hood in Judea, Samaria, go, go to the outskirts, the suburbs in Samaria, and then to the uttermost places where nobody, nobody else wants to go. Go there. Go with your power. Father God, we thank you today for power. Power, God, where we are right now. Father, give us the strength, the courage, the stamina, to see your presence even in our present situation. Whatever that situation might be, Father, we pray that we would search for your presence. And we ask you to send your power. Now, Father, what we need is your saving power. If there's somebody here today who's yet to seek and to search after their own soul's salvation, who's yet to connect with the Christ who at the cross died for each one of us, who's yet to submit their life humbly to God, who's yet to say, yes, Lord. We pray, God, that when the invitation to discipleship is extended, that they would be compelled divinely by your presence and your power to come. Then, Father, maybe you sent some folks here today who've been seeking and searching for a church home, a family of faith, a place, God, of permanent spiritual residency, a place where you can use them and strengthen them, nurture their gifts, and, God, where it is that you can place them and give them power. If they know that Antioch Church is the place where you've called them to be, the church in which you've called them to serve and to work, we pray, God, that when the invitation to membership is extended, that they would be compelled to come. In the name of Jesus, where all of our power rests, in the name of Jesus our Christ, we pray. The people of God pray together. Amen.